Hi, this is Leland Snyder, and I just want to make one quick comment before the fleeced gas lease workshop begins. Of course, Bluestone had an outstanding request for a certificate of public convenience. In addition to that, with that same request was a request for a light and regulatory regime. Now, with the exception of one person in the town of Sanford that I know of, no one else became aware of an electronic form in which they could read up on what the requests actually were and provide feedback until 8-19-2012. Of course, on 9-11-2012, the Town Board of Sanford barred all comment on natural gas development. On, I believe, 9-22, the chairman of the DPS submitted for approval the both requests, the request for a certificate for public convenience and the request for a light and regulatory regime to the full board. In the October town board meeting, Dewey Decker reported this as being, it has been, a Bluestone has been approved. In fact, it was only submitted for the full board for a vote for 817 and at that time it was approved unanimously. The point I'm making is what a light and regulatory regime is. It's not about pollution control. It's about price structure. It means they're not being viewed as a monopoly and they could set their at the wellhead price and the price they sell it to the mainline pipeline Millennium or the Tennessee as they see fit. So if at some point in the future you find or you feel that at the wellhead price is not fair and reasonable, you cannot, I do not believe you could contact the DPS on this because they will say that a grant of light and regulatory regime was granted and if you had a problem with that you should have complained in August and September of 2012 and you did not, so you missed your opportunity. So, let's uh, get back to the gas lease workshop. Well, as things come to mind, if you have no paper or pen, jot some questions down, because I attended one of their presentations before, and it's just so informative, it's unbelievable. So much information is going to be flowing through your brains. You're going to have to process it for a while to think about it. Now, we're extremely excited to have Alan Harrison, a geologist, Joseph Heath, lawyer, and we'll give you a little bit more biographical information in a minute. But we would like to sort of share what our objectives for the evening are. And I wrote them down so I'd be organized about this. We hope to provide you, no, we will provide you with an educational workshop which will inform you of your legal rights concerning lease termination, force majeure, insurance, and should you choose to sell your property, real estate implications. Compulsory integration could also be discussed. So, keeping that in mind, have your pens and pencils ready. Jot, jot down questions that you would like to ask later. And uh, I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Mary Covart. I'm a longtime Town of Sanford resident and a member of SOAP. And I'd like to introduce another SOAP member, Gail Masanti. And others of our group are out in the audience, and they'll be glad to talk with you later this evening if you want, also. So, Gail? Ellen Harrison. She's a geologist and environmental scientist. She retired a couple of years ago from the Cornell University, where she directed the Cornell Waste Management Institute for many years. Ellen and her husband leased mineral rights on their 33 acres several years ago, before the shale gas development was under discussion. Upon learning about the potentially devastating impacts of shale development, Ellen formed Fleece an organization providing a voice to landholders who lease mineral rights but now realize that shale gas exploitation threatens their land, air, water, and communities. And this is Ellen.
everybody who's in this night. Good evening. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for coming on this beautiful night when I'm sure you'd rather be out gardening. Um, so, as you heard, uh, my husband and I signed the gas lease uh, not that many years ago, and we realized after some time that what fracking was, and by fracking, I mean the whole thing. I don't just mean when you push water in and crack the rock. I mean when you do the exploration and you do the drilling and you do the hydraulic fracturing and you do the compression and you do the transmission, etc. When we realized uh, what the potential implications were, I literally didn't sleep for about three nights. I was, I was quite horrified by the idea of what might happen in my community to, and me personally, my land. And I realized that if I had signed, and I'm a relatively intelligent person with an environmental background, and I care about my land, I don't, you know, the amount of money I was offered was not a lot and I didn't need it. I was persuaded by the landman to sign. And I was very ashamed. Um, and in my community, I'd run into people and they'd say, you know, how about that fracking? And I'd be like, uh, hide my head. And then I realized that that was not okay, that I had to basically come out. And so I actually wrote a little op-ed piece for the newspaper in which I said, I was sold a bill of goods and I bought it. And I am uh, unwilling to let things just go forward. And I realized that if I've signed, an awful lot of people, probably pretty much everybody who signed in the past, had no idea what they were signing up for. And so uh, I formed Fleeced, a bad pun, um, for people who were in my kind of a position. And our objective really is educational. Uh, I wanted to find out what were the implications of having a lease. And as you'll see, the more I learned, the more I was, what? You're kidding me. They can do that? So we are trying to share that information. and. As part of uh, Joe Heath and I have basically been, been doing presentations around together um, with my presenting some about what are the implications of having a lease and Joe who's a lawyer presenting um, some information about how can a lease actually be terminated and what are some of the other issues. Um, what we have come to as a, a, a way of operating is Joe has reviewed hundreds of leases for free because he is sickened by what's happening to people. And the agreement that we've come to is fleeced my organization, address is there, there's a brochure up front, out there, that we would compile the necessary information, a copy of the lease, a copy of any letters, a copy of uh, what people's questions are. And when we've compiled all that, then we can send it to Joe electronically. So if people can send it electronically, that's great. And if they can't, then we'll scan it, send it back to them as well as on to Joe, so that Joe can review it and provide advice to people. May I ask how many people in this audience have a gas lease? A lot of you, okay. And how many of you are, know what compulsory integration is and are concerned about it? All right, it helps me figure out what we want to talk about. Uh, okay, Joe, if I face this this way, is that gonna do it? Yes! Um, so, it's time for us to get organized, it's time for us to start squawking because the leases that we signed are horrendous. We, we, we hoped that Fleece would have a lawsuit to bring against the gas companies because we were lied to, I don't know about you, but I was lied to. But what we found out when we talked with an attorney for quite a while was they can lie to you so long as it's not in the, in the lease, it doesn't really hold water. And also one of the things you find out is that being unjust, unfair, doesn't make it illegal. So we found that we did not have at that point a general lawsuit to be able to bring. But there are uh, some, some aspects of the law that Joe will particularly talk about. So, I don't know about you, but the guy came to my kitchen table, came a number of times, it's patriotic, it's democratic, it's local gas, it's gonna, we're gonna be in and out in a couple of days, or maybe it was a couple of weeks, actually. Uh, 
water pollution, oh, you know, no documented cases, just a lot of uh, salesmanship. You know, the patriotic thing is one that really irks me because we all do care about energy independence. The idea of being dependent on countries that are unstable and have governments that are uh, of concern to us uh, is a reason I think a number of us signed. But the reality is that now our leases are being sold to foreign companies. Norse, who now owns a lot of the leases in this area, is not an American company. Uh, Chesapeake sold a third of every lease to uh, a Scandinavian country. Um, China is buying up leases like crazy. So, and the U.S. is, um, uh, the gas companies are looking for approvals to build facilities along the coastlines which take gas, which go in these big pipelines, which I know you're all familiar with around here, take it to the coast and uh, under pressure liquefy it and then ship it overseas. This is a capitalist system and it's going to go where they're going to get the best price for it. And right now the price in the U.S. is really low and there's no law that says it's got to stay here. It's going to go where the price is many times greater in both Europe and China and India. Uh, you know, oh, there's going to be a well here. Well, they don't tell you that on a well pad, which may be 10 acres, 5 to 10 acres, there may be 10 wells. And so when he says it's going to be a few weeks, well, it might drill one well in a few weeks. But if they're implementing well after well, it's going to be many years. My favorite one is the radioactivity one. So if the person asks about radioactivity, just tell them we don't use any. Well, they don't use any. But there's radioactivity in the uh, geological formation, the Marcellus, that uh, the gas is coming up from. And therefore, both the gas itself and fluids that come back are radioactive. And the drill cuttings as they drill are radioactive. And in fact, recently a couple of trucks were turned away from the landfill because it, they were significantly radioactive. Most of us, again, I mean, I don't know about you, I did take my lease to my lawyer, but my lawyer knew nothing about gas leasing. So it was not a terribly helpful exercise. Probably cost me a couple hundred dollars, but it didn't really get me anywhere. The uh, first clause sort of says what they're allowed to do, what the, the leasee, the gas company, is allowed to do. And generally, it is really broad. Uh, they're allowed to drill any formation, they can explore, they can. Uh, transmit and transport, and uh, in many cases they can store gas under your property. We signed something that would let them go for any geological <coughs> formation under our property. Wiser people in other states, I mean, it's again, one of the reasons, you know, I feel stupid, but we didn't know was limited to one formation. You can write a lease that says you can drill the Marcellus, but that isn't the way most of our leases read. So as I said, they can probably construct pipelines, they can do compression facilities, which is not a good thing. Uh, they can store gas. So one of the things as we began to look into, okay, so I signed a lease, I was stupid, and they can do stuff, is what are the implications for me? And one of the questions is liability. So as you know, in this country, anybody can be sued for anything. It doesn't mean that the lawsuit will win, but they can sue you. And what is happening is hopefully all of us have homeowner's insurance. That insurance does not cover anything to do with gas development. Never did, never will. It covers, you know, your toaster malfunctioning and burning your house down, or a guest coming and tripping their tripping and breaking the leg. It covers those kinds of things. Um, we're now actually hearing that some companies are refusing to renew homeowners insurance on properties where there are gas leases because they're just worried. But 
if something happens because of a gas operation, whatever it is, on your property, and somebody gets hurt, you don't have insurance to cover that unless you've managed to get a special policy. I've not heard anybody who did. And I've heard of a case, I haven't verified it, in Pennsylvania where actually a worker, a gas worker, was killed on a gas site in an accident. And his family sued not only the gas company, but also the property owner. Basically, you sue everybody you can if you're gonna sue. And whether or not the uh, family wins that case, the, home, the property owner has to defend it. You have to mount a defense, and that's an expensive uh, and, and emotionally trying proposition. Oh. The last thing, so when you have a mortgage or a loan, you uh, must have homeowner's insurance because they have an interest in your property. They want to be sure that they'll be covered. And if you can't get homeowner's insurance, then you become in default of your mortgage. So one of the things is don't let your homeowner's policy lapse if you have a lease. Be sure that you keep up to date with it because for the most part, I'm not hearing about them canceling, but I'm hearing that they're declining to renew or to give you a new policy. Not all companies, but it's of concern. This was an interesting one that came up in the southern tier because of the flooding that's been going on down in the Binghamton area. Has there been flooding around here as well? Some. So I guess FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, has a program where they can buy out properties that have been subject to flooding. And they have now said, or this happened recently, they can't buy out leased properties because the property owner doesn't hold the whole interest in the property. So that's an interesting wrinkle. So when you go to get a mortgage, almost all mortgages are sold on the secondary market. The bank doesn't hold them, they sell them. And to meet the market requirements, the, to sell them in the secondary market, they have to meet certain standards. And Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have set standards, and HUD as well for certain loans. And those standards basically say no surface or subsurface entry within 200 feet of a residential structure. Uh, so it's abundantly clear that you can't have a well pad 200 feet from your house, which effectively says there should be a five acre circle around your house. Question about whether a barn is residential structure, question about whether my pond is considered a residential structure. Um, one of the things we're now hearing is that people with gas leases who don't have an area around their house at least, off limits to the gas company, um, that some of them are able to get mortgages, but they're paying 2% higher. So instead of 3.75 3 or 4, they're paying uh, 5.75 um, or 6, because the bank is going to hold that mortgage, and they consider it risky. Some people are also just not being able to get a mortgage. And HUD has a slightly larger setback requirement. We talked with the DEC over the last couple of years, basically saying, you know, you better do a setback from people's residences because otherwise this mortgage thing is going to kick in. And um, it remains to be seen, as you well know. There are there are no regulations in place at this point in the state. Also, you find out that you're in technical default of your mortgage for a number of other reasons. One is, in many mortgage documents, it says you will not store or use hazardous chemicals in more than sort of household amounts. And frankly, if you have a gas well and they're bringing on uh, the chemicals that they use in fracking, etc. Uh, you're in violation of that aspect of your mortgage. 
And the other thing is, not surprisingly, but my lawyer didn't point it out, um, you are not allowed to sell an interest in your property when you have a mortgage because they gave you the mortgage based on the value of your land and your house and whatever. And now you've just sold the mineral rights. Not sold them, excuse me. You've leased the mineral rights. Do not ever sell them. You've leased the mineral rights. So you've given up an interest in your property and you are a technical violation of your mortgage. I haven't heard of any mortgages being called, but they could. This one I did not believe, but it's true. My lease doesn't say, and the maximum extent they can use of my 33 acres is five acres. I, I, I didn't put a limit on it. And the reality is, if you didn't put a limit on it, they can use as much of your land as they want to. They also can go anywhere on your land they want to, unless you restricted it. And then, um, you better hope that they abide by what you wrote in the lease. I have um, friends who basically said, you know, no activities during hunting season, no use of the part of this pasture that is important to me, and even for a conventional well, at least one of the people I know, they ignored it, and they basically ruined their best field. This is the latest wrinkle that I just learned about. I mean, I laugh because I, I just can't believe it. So, a mechanic's lien, have any of you heard of what that is? You know? The basic idea is, you know, I'm having guys paint my house right now. I haven't paid them. If I don't pay them, they can put, go to the county clerk's office and put a lien on my property. Before this property can be sold, this $8,000 bill for painting must be paid. Okay. In Pennsylvania, in Bradford County, to add insult to injury, one of the people who has a contaminated well and therefore has basically lost the value of his property has had mechanics liens put on his property to the tunes of many thousands of dollars because Chesapeake didn't pay the subcontractors who put in the road or dug a pit. I'm not sure which contractors didn't get paid. So this guy not only has a contaminated well now, but he has this lien on his property. So because the improvement was done on the property, they can put a lien on the property, even though the guy himself didn't ask for this to happen. Joe's gonna talk more about this. When is the lease over? And uh, many leases had a five-year term, and then in small print, a five-year right to renew on the part of the gas company without your say-so. And if they just sent you a check for the original amount, you know, you will renew it another five years. Some people cross that out, and their leases really are expiring, and Joe will talk about that. If there is activity on your land that tends to hold the lease open. And what's the definition of an activity? And again, I'm gonna let Joe speak more to that. Um, one of the things that's happening in Pennsylvania, one of the reasons they're doing a lot of drilling is they wanna get things active, and then they can put it on hold, not pay you anything because they're not actually taking any gas, but that holds your lease open. We'll talk more about force majeure. How many people here have gotten a letter claiming force majeure? Okay. Uh, the concept is um, you are in a contract. I'm in a contract with the guys painting my house, and they promise that they're going to have it done by May the 12th. But uh, there's a trucker strike, and they can't get the paint and whatever. Or it rains constantly, they can't paint my house. Force majeure says they can be excused from meeting that May 12th deadline because they couldn't. There was a, a, a force that was great and they couldn't meet it. The gas companies are misusing that and are claiming that the uh, state moratorium, it's not really a moratorium, but that the state on holdness because of the environmental review is grounds for force majeure. And that has been, uh, in one court case, shown to be invalid 
and Joe and I have been working to get Chesapeake to release leases when this is their only claim, and now we need to start working on Norse. So, if you have a force majeure claim and you would like to have us help you, I will need, as I said, my agreement with Joe is we'll get a copy of all the relevant papers, so send it to me electronically if you can, uh, snail mail if you can, and we'll scan it, but I need the lease and I need the force majeure letter and any other letters you've gotten from the gas company and um, a note from you that says help us please and would have contact information for you and then we can proceed from there. So, most of you, do you know what a spacing unit is? Not yes if you know what I'm talking about. A few of you. Basically, when a gas company applies for a permit, and frankly, they can apply for a permit today, it won't be granted until the state has sorted out the environmental review deal. But they can apply for a permit today. And I actually saw a bunch of leases from Sanford in which the, we can hold your lease open as long as, as long as we've applied for a permit, which is crazy because anybody can apply. Okay, when they apply for a permit, they, oh, let's see, there's a cute little green thing. So this is a spacing unit. It's usually about a square mile, which is not square. It's extended in the direction that the cracks in the rock go, because it's easier to drill and get gas out of that direction. And the gas company applies to DEC and says, we want a permit for this spacing unit. And legally, they are supposed to have control over 60% of the land in that unit. They either own it or they have a lease on it. And the other 40% of the land, which could be a lot more than 40% of the population, can be subject to compulsory integration. So here is a spacing unit. This is just a cartoon that I drew that says, okay, if this is your spacing unit now, 60% could be one property owner, right? I mean, it could be a large landholder. And one of the things you find if you do maps that show how many, how many acres are leased and what percentage of the population owns it, not surprisingly, a very small percentage of the population are the people who own most of the leased land. Big landholders, that's who stood, uh, that's who the gas company came to to try to persuade to lease. So in this uh, cartoon, we have, that's leased, this, which might be as many as 16 properties, just the relative, uh, when you look at what's happening in the state, if one person owned all of that, it might be 16 people who owned this 40% and they would be subject to compulsory integration. And what that means is when the gas company applies to the state, if the state DEC decides to give them a permit, then the people who are in that green hashered area will be forced to give up their gas. They will be forced to allow the gas company to drill under their land, not to come on the surface, but to drill and frack their, their land, because each of us owns down to the middle of the earth. So that's my land. And basically it's eminent domain. And you know, personally I think eminent domain makes sense in some cases. You're not gonna be able to build a road if you need a road without eminent domain. But that's in the public interest and it's the state getting that right. In this case, basically, we're giving the private gas company eminent domain powers. And they don't have to. The drilling technology is so good, it's so amazing, they can avoid specific properties. So there's no reason this has to be. It was passed in a time when the legislature was thinking about sort of old-fashioned gas wells, and old-fashioned gas wells were basically like a straw going down. And if they hit a crack that had a lot of gas in it that would move freely, and that crack went under your property, even though it was on my property, I could drain your gas. And so the legislature said, well, that's not fair. We ought to at least pay her something for her gas. But this is completely different. They only get gas where they drill 
and then they fracture it with the high-powered water, sand, and chemicals. And so they have to frack in order to get the gas. They don't have to frack her land. They could avoid it. The other thing this slide shows, although it's hard to read, is imagine this property. And it has a tiny corner that's in this spacing unit. Most leases say if any portion of your property is within a spacing unit, we will hold your lease. You cannot cancel your lease, even when it expires. And let's say they really did drill in this spacing unit and they really did start to generate some royalties, which we have questions about and you'll hear. All of this property is not within the spacing unit. So that little bit would get royalties, which is about nothing. And all of this would be held. Uh, it's not clear to me whether this is a strategy the gas companies are using, but it would sure make sense. This amazes me as well. How would you know if your property, whether you have a lease or not, is part of a proposed spacing unit or a spacing unit that actually gets approved? The answer is there's no requirement to notify you. If you are subject to compulsory integration, then there is a notice requirement. They must send you a letter. I think you have less than 30 days to respond. And the letter would come from the DEC, and the DEC has a hearing. Well, a hearing sounds good. It turns out that the hearing is strictly about which way, pardon my French, do you want to get screwed. Uh, it's not about whether or not they should approve the permit. That's not the question. The question is, do you want to be a participating owner in the well and put up millions of dollars in risk? Do you want to be a minimalist and basically just get the minimal 12.5% royalty and basically have no liabilities uh, for the well itself. That's what you can choose uh, if you are subject to compulsory integration. You can't choose whether you want to be in it, you can't go and argue and say why are you allowing this. So the onus is on the landowner and I actually just found out, I'm really quite excited about it, what county am I in? Delaware. Good. I, and Broome. Good. I just found out that some citizens have been doing research on what permits have been applied for in the last two years. And they have developed mailing information, because it's public information, uh, by matching it up with tax parcels, that they have developed information that says, here are the people who have leases within these proposed spacing units, and here are the people who would be subject to compulsory integration. And Delaware and Broome and Shenango are among those. And we are developing a mailing to those people so that they can at least learn about the current situation and, and where they are relative to a, a spacing unit. I wanted to talk a little bit because there are people at the conversations that Joe and I go to who are thinking about leasing. Um, and there are uh, clearly um, landowner coalitions are vocal and they believe that they can write a good lease. So this, uh, the idea of the landowner coalition is let's get a lot of people together, that'll give us some bargaining power with the gas companies rather than just me. It'll be hundreds of acres, hundreds of thousands of acres we got a good lawyer to work with us, we have an accountant to work with us, we can do it right. And I want to raise a few issues, because frankly, I don't think there is any such thing as a good lease. I also think that even if you got a personal lease that wasn't too bad, what it does to the community is pretty horrific. So personally, I'm just telling you where I come from, but I wanted to talk to some of the issues about is there a good lease? One of the things, again, Joe's going to talk about more is, is, are you getting rich? Are people getting rich? Some people got pretty good signing bonuses. That's when you sign up, how many dollars per acre. A lot of us didn't, but some people did. And some people hope they will. But then what happens? Really, according to people in Texas, the money is not in the upfront payment, it's in the royalties. But what's happened now is many leases 
won't pay any royalties until the gas company has gotten all their costs back, including transmission, including multi-million dollar salaries to people. And right now the price of gas is so low that they're really not making a profit. So talk to the people in Pennsylvania. Find out if they're getting rich. It pays to be a little skeptical. Uh, I wasn't skeptical enough early on. But the lawyers that work for the joint coalitions and the joint coalitions who, the organizers, they are only going to make money based on the number of acres that are signed up in a lease. So their interest is to get a lease signed. If you join a coalition, you're always free not to sign a lease. But you're sort of joining it because you want them to be providing the knowledge and uh, looking out for you. And I guess I'm a little skeptical because their interest has got to be in getting a lease signed. Make no mistake, it's an industrial process there will be risks. Many of those risks are accidents. Many of the risks, I mean, we've talked about water pollution things, people are aware of that, but things happen because of spills and leaks when you're dealing with these kinds of materials. Things happen because casings fail. In, in um, Pennsylvania, the data for the states show that six to eight percent of the casings fail within the first year. Well, that's, to me, not a really good record. If there are, you know, 100 wells going in, that's six or eight wells that are causing issues. It's very important to remember that a lease can set out the criteria, but you can't be assured the, the uh, compliance record of the gas companies is not very good. And if they violate the terms of your lease, I don't want you to drill on that part of my land, that, you know, that's not allowed. And they do. Or even something as simple as, I want fencing to keep my animals, whether it's my dog or my cows or whatever, or neighbors, out of the site. And let's say they don't do it. What are you prepared to do about it? A lease basically gives you the right to sue them if they're not following the lease terms. But that is not a minor thing to think about taking on. Sometimes there's uh, data requirements. You know, if you contaminate my well, you're going to give me water. Now, they can't fix the dirty water. They might be able to supply you with bottled water or something like that. But proving who done it, in my previous life, uh, I worked for the state of Connecticut doing groundwater pollution work. And with the resources of the state behind me, it was incredibly hard to prove what the source of water pollution was to a well. It's just not very straightforward moving underground. So how are you going to prove who done it if something bad happens? One of the clauses in many leases is arbitration. And I, when I saw it, I thought, well, that's good. You know, people should talk it out. I, I like that idea. Well, it turns out that arbitration in this kind of a setting means the gas company chooses an arbitration you choose an arbiter, and then together I think they choose a third one. And it becomes finan financially a big drain, because you're paying these people. This isn't like your community dispute resolution center doing it for free. You're paying these people big bucks. And then you can go to court later. So it's, it's not a good thing to have that clause. So what can we do? Um, Joe's going to talk about some things you can do to question the force majeure if there's been such a claim, and also to talk about if your lease has expired, what you can do to have it actually terminated. It's seeming to me that probably the most important thing, as you may know, uh, the town just north of where I live was one of the early towns to pass a ban against fracking. Again, fracking writ large. Um, and that just, what, two days ago, Joe? Three days ago? Very recently. So it goes to court. The Supreme Court is the lowest level of court in our state. When it went through the Supreme Court, the case, the gas company was suing the town. You don't have the right to do this. 
And at that first level, the town won. The gas company, and in this case actually Norse, took over the lawsuit. Norse challenged the ban again at the next level, the Court of Appeals. And just recently, within the last week anyway, there was a unanimous decision of five judges in favor of the town. The town has the right. The gas company can try to appeal it to the next, the highest level, but frankly, they have to get permission to do it from the court because uh, a unanimous decision at that middle level court means it has to be granted the right to appeal. And I think I read something like only six to seven percent of those who go to that highest court and ask for uh, it to hear, only six to seven percent get granted. So things are looking good for a town ban. So my own view is that is the best assurance and that will help us from the time clock till our leases expire. One of the things I found fascinating is in many rural towns, I think a lot of the town board members have leased and I don't think they know the things I was just telling you. And I can't imagine why if they knew they wouldn't be in favor of a ban because most of them signed bad old leases. And uh, there's a few things out at the table outside if you want them. Uh, one is something from the AG's office in Maryland. Our own attorney general has been bad on this issue. Unfortunately, he ran on an anti-fracking campaign, but he hasn't really been uh, very helpful. Uh, this is another thing, get the answers before signing a lease, and it raises some of the questions. So if you know people who are thinking of leasing, I, I would ask you to share this information with them. And then out there is a packet like this, and we put it together as something where we would hope that you might be able to educate your town boards about what you're facing if you signed a lease. I would hope between the lines that they would see it's what they're facing if they signed a lease. Um, so that packet is out there, and <coughs> locals here have put together a list of addresses for town board members. They do need to hear from, um, from those of us with a lot to lose. Thank you very much, and we'll answer questions after. speaker is Joe Key. He's been a general counsel for the Onondaga Nation since 1982 and an attorney since 1975. For the nation, his work centers on environmental protection, particularly under the Clean Water Act, focusing on Onondaga Lake and Onondaga Creek, archaeologic site and unmarked burial site protection, NAGPRA repatriation and litigation, hunting and fishing rights, treaty rights, excise, tax issues, and land rights. In addition to these current areas of work, Joe has extensive experience in civil rights litigation, having worked on the Attica Civil Rights class action case for 29 years before it settled in 2000 for $12 million. Criminal defense and trials, family law, protection of abused and neglected children, fighting domestic violence are all what Joe has championed. Joe is also an active member of the Veterans for Peace. So our next speaker is Joseph Keith. Slick water hydraulic fracturing is a very industrial process. 
pictures that start off here were all taken within the last year in Pennsylvania. You're very close to Pennsylvania. Some of you may have been over there. Uh, it's a little fuzzy here. Let me see if we can focus this. Uh, here's a, a dairy farm. There's a silo. Here's a drilling bay. You can see how much bigger this operation is than the farm itself. And most of us thought, very much like Ellen, my brother-in-law, I live up in Cortland County, we'll see some maps about that. My brother-in-law lives about a mile west of me, and seven years ago he came to me and asked me should he sign a gas lease. I didn't know enough to tell him not to. And the conventional wisdom was, it's easy money, uh, particularly the farmers up there have been leasing successively, and nobody ever drilled a well, and the wells were all what we call your grandfather's gas well. They could fit on that platform and you could plant flowers around them. That is not what fracking is. There's another well pad. You can see what happens to life in homes when this comes in your backyard. So it's a very industrial process. What we hope to do tonight, uh, what I will go over tonight, is uh, you need to really understand how the companies use your individual lease primarily as a commodity. In fact, right now they don't want to drill in New York because they can't make money. And so they hold leases, bundle them together, and then sell them off or sell off pieces. And we'll go through uh, most of my information is about Chesapeake because they're the major leaseholder in Onondaga and Portland County where I do most of my work. And because they had a really loudmouth CEO who gave us some great quotes and explained the business model that all of the companies use. We also have some information about Norse and their bankruptcy um, because I know they're active around here. Um, so it's important to understand why they're clinging to these leases and why they're trying to extend them illegally and why it's so hard to end your lease. Um, Ellen has touched on what's given away in a standard lease. I'll review that very briefly. And then we'll go over the New York law about how to cancel your lease. Your lease doesn't just end. Even though it says five years or 10 years or however many years, it has a termination date, it sits there in the county clerk's office as a cloud on your title until you do something. Under this section of the New York law, the General Obligations Law 15304, and we'll walk through what you have to do there. It's not simple. None of this is simple. They don't want you to understand your rights. And that's why we go around and, and make these presentations. Uh, we're also going to go over some of the recent attempts by Chesapeake and Norse to extend leases and what you can do if you've gotten one of those letters and um, what you can do if your lease has been extended. So again, these are industrial operations. These are uh, compressors. In order to frack the, uh, the gas, uh, you know, they got all the easy gas. It used to be they just, mainly over in the western part of the state and other parts of the country, they just drill a vertical hole down into a pocket of gas, and very much like drinking a soda, they would just suck the gas out. They got all that. Now the gas they're going after is in deep shale layers. We'll show you a map of those in a minute. And it's in microscopic pockets. And so they have to break the shale up, fracture it, frack it. In order to do that, they use about 8 million gallons of water, sand, and a mixture of chemicals that is highly toxic. Uh, and in order to do that, they have to have all this pressure that comes from compressors, and these are compressors. Now, all of this is constant, 24-7, huge diesel engines running all the time. Uh, drilling, compressing, uh, various other things hundreds of trucks, very industrial. This is a map of all of the shale, they call them plays, it's not a very playful subject, but they call them plays. These are the shale formations around the country. This is the combined Marcellus and Utica, and so you can see why we're at ground zero. This is the biggest area. 
This is a depth chart. You probably can't read these, but this is the Marcellus. The CO has to be at least 2,000 feet below the ground in New York for them to allow fracking. Uh, that's the 2,000 foot depth there. So clearly they can go after the Marcellus. There's the 2,000. So they can clearly go after the Marcellus here. But as uh, Helen said, they're not limited to any one formation. And if they drill here, and they go into the Marcellus, they won't stop there. They'll come back around and go after the Utica, which is another shale formation 3,000 or so feet below the Marcellus. So rather than just one set of wells, what we're seeing in some of the other states, Ohio, this is going on, they will clean out the Marcellus if they can, and then come back later on and go back down more deeply and then frack the Marcellus. This is Cortland County. I hope you can see what it's supposed to show. Whoops. So these brown areas are leased. This was in the newspaper about two and a half years ago. The county planning department put this together. It's a very helpful tool. It certainly woke us up in Portland. Um, woke a lot of people up. Many of us knew this. 48% the land area in our county is leased. The green areas you see are state forests, and you would think that those would be safe, but they're not. The DEC is leasing state forests for fracking. So they have, the DEC has a three-way conflict. They, they are trying to make a profit off of leasing state land. The state environmental conservation law mandates that they promote the development of the resource. In other words, get as much gas out as they can. And then they're supposed to turn around and regulate that. It's the same conflict of interest that led to the deep water horizon. So the green areas are not safe. Um, so 48% is leased. The paper then explained that that is that was done by only 8% of the landowners. So half our county is leased by 40, by 8%. And if you factor in that there are probably as many people living in the city of uh, Portland down here and the village of Homer and other uh, larger, there aren't too many large places in Portland County, but if there are as many people who don't own land as do, fewer than 5% of our neighbors, at least half our county. And one of the reasons that uh, I go out as much as I do is that my well sits in this sole source aquifer, this yellow area, which is not easy to see, is a glacially uh, produced aquifer, sole source aquifer. It's the only source of drinking water for any of us who live above them. It's about 30 feet deep very shallow aquifer, and if they drill through there and make a mistake, if one of those casings fails, and they fail all the time, then 50,000 of us no longer have water. So that's kind of a background of where we are. Chesapeake is the second largest gas company in the uh, United States, second only to Exxon, who brought their way back into this industry about six years ago. And they, their own words explain to us what these leases mean to them. And I think it's important if you hold the lease to, to have this understanding of why they're holding your lease. And um, what they explained in their Securities and Exchange Commission filings was that back in 2006, they developed a policy that they called the gas shale land grab. 2006. That's what the company called. So the idea was to go out and lease as much as they could in the areas where they, the shale looked promising and where they had done some seismic testing, and to get those leases as quickly as they could and as quietly as they could before anybody knew what they were going to do and before anybody knew what the real value of the leases should be and before people knew that you didn't have to take that standard lease that the landman brought to your kitchen table and you could have any lease you wanted to. But as Alan says, the lease is only a piece of paper and 
what we find in Pennsylvania and West Virginia is the companies do what they want, and then your only recourse is to try to uh, handle that lien. But they went out and grabbed lien. That's their words. Um, and they got about, now I think they have about 16,000 acres, although now they're in such horrible financial shape that they're selling off assets. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, what they're doing is selling to foreign corporations because a lot of foreign corporations, particularly the Chinese, who are their major investors now, they want the technology so that they can develop their own shale gas, and they want the gas. The gas in the United States is selling a little bit, less than $3 a million uh, cubic feet. In Japan, it's 16. And so they are applying and receiving permits to export. So when you see these ads about patriotism and about saving soldiers, that's not what it's about. Because the first permit that was issued within about four months ago by the Federal Energy Commission went to a, a combination that was 30% owned by Exxon and 70% owned by the state oil company of the country of Qatar. Right there in the... Um, right next to Saudi Arabia in the Persian Gulf. Those companies, countries that we're not going to have anything to do with because of energy independence. Qatar is the largest um, shipper of liquefied natural gas in the world. But that's what's going to happen to any gas from now on. It's not going to be sold here if they can get these permits. Now this is about a year ago, March of uh, last year, 2012, the uh, former uh, CEO of Chesapeake, Aubrey McClendon, who just retired on the 1st of April, a uh, real rough retirement package he had to accept, it was only $47 million. That's what happens with your leases. The companies and their CEOs get filthy rich. But before he left, he gave us some great words of wisdom. Uh, this was in Rolling Stone, uh, March 1st of 2012. I can assure you that uh, the primary profit from fracking comes not from selling the gas itself, but from buying and flipping leases for the land that contains the gas. By flipping, he means selling it for a profit. I can assure you that by buying leases for X and selling them for five to ten times X, we make more money than we do when we try to produce gas at five or six million dollars per million cubic foot is now below three. So in order for them to make a profit now off these leases, they have to sell either all of them or a portion of them. Drilling, they actually lose money. And that's what's happened to both Chesapeake and Norse's business model. They did all that land grab and got all these leases in 2004, 5, 6, when the price of gas was eight and nine dollars. So they built a business model and selling it at 8 and $9, and it's now a third of that. There's no profit for that. That's why Norse has declared bankruptcy, and why Chesapeake is trying to sell off $13 billion in their assets uh, to foreign corporations. In 2010, Chesapeake sold uh, land in Texas to China's largest oil company for $11,000 an acre. We've given dozens of these talks to hundreds if not thousands of people. Nobody has ever gotten anywhere near $11,000 an acre, but that's what the companies can get for these leases. And what that results in is uh, Mr. McClendon's personal wealth of about $1.2 billion, including a $20 million resort in Bermuda. And what annoys me is that he ruins the NBA playoffs because he owns the Thunder, and last year I couldn't root for the underdog during the, during the championship. Um, so at the end of January, they announced that McClendon was leaving. Their stock shot up 6%, and um, he's taking $47 million with him. Now, so in New York, and, and it's a great example, they, they brought a lot of leases, and, and so did Norris. In order to pay for the amount of money they spent buying the leases, 
they have what they call joint venture partners, foreign corporations that buy a portion of the leases. And in New York, Chesapeake sold 32.5%, just under a third of all of their leases to Stad Oil Hydro, a Norwegian company. They got more for that third than they paid all of the landowners put together. So they've already made a profit without even drilling, and yet they still control two-thirds of that lease. And that's their business model. The five largest joint ventures they sold uh, for $19.9 billion. This billion, that's what every little lease. So it's like a big monopoly game to them. They grab all the little greenhouses they can, they pile them up, and then they sell them for profit. That's why it's, they're clinging to these leases. So that's the business model that I think it's important to understand. But then that's not even the whole picture. This is a headline from uh, March of 2012 that reveals, and now Chesapeake and Incan are under investigation in the state of Michigan because they colluded to keep the prices down. And under McClendon's direction, uh, he told his landman, stop competing with Incana out there. In emails, one from McClendon himself, he told a vice president in Michigan, smoke the peace pipe within Canada if we are bidding each other up. We're both working to avoid bidding each other up. In other words, they don't want a fair market for you. They want to collude behind the scenes and pay you as little as they can. That's now under investigation. They also don't pay any taxes. Chesapeake has been in business for 23 years. They've made 5.5 billion in pre-tax profits and paid a whopping 53 million. That's 1% over 23 years. Half of the annual salary of our favorite CEO of the company. But now they're in such finan bad financial shape, they're coming back at, at uh, leaseholders in Ohio, <coughs> trying to force them to, to accept alterations to the lease. If you've ever tried to get Chesapeake or any other company to accept a change to your lease, you'll know that they never do that. In Ohio, what they were trying to do was get people who had already <coughs> leased to agree to larger spacing units. So if the spacing unit is 60, 640 um, acres, and they drill one well in that, they can hold that number of properties by drilling one well. It's called hold by production. We'll get into that a little bit later. If you agree to a larger spacing unit of twice or three times the size, they can drill one well and encumber twice or three times the number of properties. And they're going back to people in Ohio and telling them, we won't drill here unless you agree to this, and then you won't get any of your wood. They're also not paying royalties, and skipping on royalties, and taking out costs that are not in the contract. They're in horrible financial shape, and they're taking it out on the landowners one way or another. And so they're being sued in Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Kansas, I know Pennsylvania now, uh, because they won't pay royalties there they should be under the contract. This is Bloomberg News, uh, I think that's July of last year. This is from Texas in 2011. So, Chesapeake notified their leaseholders, we're going to start deducting our post-production costs. That means cleaning the gas, uh, taking the moisture out of it, separating the various gases, the methane from the propane and the ethane, ethylene and toluene, and compressing it and then pumping it 
all of that gets deducted before they pay royalties, even though the lease says the opposite. So there's a lot of Norse leases over here in the eastern part of the state. Uh, as we get further east, we see more Norse. Uh, they filed for bankruptcy this December. And many people wonder, well, what does that do to my lease? Does that end my lease? The answer is no, it doesn't. They're under Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which is where companies try to restructure their debt and then come out of bankruptcy and continue as a company. They're not trying to fold yet, but it's not clear that they can't get, um, they need a loan in order to keep the bankruptcy going during that bad financial shape. And at least two of those have fallen through. But they're clinging to the leases. And if you have a Norse lease, Probably uh, within the last two months, you got a letter from Norris about their bankruptcy. The very short time to respond. And what they did there was tell the bankruptcy court that all of their leases were still valid and the only asset they had in bankruptcy. Well, the problem is that about a third of their leases have already expired by their own terms. The primary terms are old. Norse is not telling the bankruptcy court that. And some lawyers are going to the bankruptcy court to try to educate the court that they don't have all these assets. They have maybe two-thirds of what they're telling you. So you can't do an accurate bankruptcy if they're inflating what their assets are. So that's why Norse is clinging to your lease. They did try to sell all their leases in New York prior to filing bankruptcy. They also sliced off various portions of their companies, pipeline assets, some other uh, production and handling assets that were still somewhat profitable, and sold those to spin-off companies that are headed by former um, high executives of Norris. But in August, they tried to sell all 120,000 acres of their New York leases Texas, including 37,000 in the western part of the state. Uh, as I said, they can't make money drilling for methane, but the price of propane and butane is still better for them. They're driving that down, too. And the reason these prices are so low is because there's so many companies in Virginia and Ohio and Pennsylvania drilling for gas and holding their lease by production uh, that they've just flooded the market and the prices. And that's ruined their business. So the bankruptcy does not end the lease. Um, and if you have one of those letters, we can talk about it after. Now, um, Ellen went over this, so I, I won't go over much. It's, it's really revealing and uh, that the landmen have a crib sheet that they use. They dropped it in Ohio about a year and a half ago. And it's how to avoid telling you what they really intend to do. Um, the one I love, though, is that the deal with the man of the house is possible as men are less likely to admit that we don't know what we understand. So, royalties. If you have a lease, you know you've got a signing bonus of a certain amount. That's been paid. And then the next money that you're looking for or that you, you were led to believe to should expect is the royalties, that if they start drilling after they deduct all their costs, that you will get some percentage of what they sell the gas for. The problem is how the definition of royalties, um, how royalties and how they figure them, how that's defined in your life. And it's um, to pay the lessor, that's you, an amount equal to one eighth of the Revenue realized by the lessee, that's the company, less the cost of transport, market, treat, and compress the gas. So they take all the costs out before they even start to calculate your royalty. Less all taxes, production, severance, windfall, profit, taxes. And so um, with the price of gas, it's, it's a little higher than that. It's higher than the 220. But it's not high enough for them to realize a profit. So if there's no revenue, there's no royalty. So 
let's, uh, so that's the background company information that uh, I hope uh, gives you some idea of, of uh, how they, they had a practice of duping people and now they're trying to do it again by extending leases and making false claims and we'll try to get through them. But first I want to walk you through what's in your lease and then what the New York law is and then we'll come back to uh, what you can do. So the first, uh, none of you who have a lease know that it's about impossible to read. It's a complex legal document, tiny print. The first paragraph called the uh, leasing clause is 20 or more lines and towards the end of it is where the really bad stuff that, that nobody explained to you is contained. Um, they can use any water they can get from your land as long as it doesn't come from your domestic well free. Um, but this is the one that's in every lease I've seen, I think. I don't know that I've seen a lease uh, of the hundreds I've reviewed that doesn't allow them to store gas from anywhere under your property. Massive amounts of gas if they can find the right formations. Or abandoned wells are now used to store it. And um, that's just in every lease. Now some people had addendums where they took that out, but 99% of the leases, they have a right to store gas, not what you borrow for. But what we're really here to talk about is when does the lease end? So you have a leasing term, uh, Ellen had one up there, most of them are five-year leases. They say that, they say, you signed this lease on May 8, 2006, it's a five-year lease, and they actually list the termination date, what appears to be the termination date of May 6, 2011. Looks clear, five years, there's the end date. Then this next paragraph, in the Chesapeake leases. In many leases, this extension paragraph is buried on page two or three and it's almost impossible to pick up. And even in a Chesapeake lease, it's very difficult to understand. And what it says, and two, this is in every lease that Chesapeake sent to people's door. Only about a third of the leases that I've reviewed has this been crossed out by the landlord. So two thirds of the people who think they have a five year lease actually have a 10 year lease. Because what this allows is that the company, at its option, can extend the lease merely by tendering to the landowner the same amount as they gave you to start the lease. Tendering means mailing the check, not you cashing it, not you getting it, not getting it to the right person many times, but tendering payment to the original person who signed the lease and then you have a 10-year lease whether you want it or not. So that's one way that they're extending the leases. And that's built into the contract and courts are very reluctant to take the wording of a contract and rule against it. If it's in black and white in your contract, you're pretty well stuck with it. Uh, companies aren't, but you are. <coughs> so another way that they're trying to extend leases they're not doing this much in New York yet, but it's, it's, it's a trick that they're using a great deal in Pennsylvania. Is uh, Somewhere in your lease is a definition of operations. The, the concept is if, 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 if they have a lease and they drill a well and it's producing, that they will stay as long as the well is produced. Makes sense. They put a lot of money into it. Um, the problem is that's not how it's worked worded by corporate lawyers, and you can see the progression in these leases over the years that get more and more company friendly and less and less landowner friendly. So the definition, this is taken from the standard Chesapeake lease, that they will extend your lease if any operations are going, either on your land or on pool land. And here's how they define them using bona fide good faith efforts to diligently prepare the surface of a physical well site prior to the commencement of actual drilling activities, including but not limited to the commencement of clearing operations on or adjacent to the well site, such as the clearing of trees, the construction of access roads, 
or the delivery of heavy equipment. If that's not broad enough, then they say any acts in search of or endeavor to obtain gas or maintain or increase the production, and then the big loophole or any acts similar or incidental to any of the four of Big enough to drive one of their 18 little trucks. And this is what they've done to people in Pennsylvania from those extend by operation clauses. This goes back actually uh, to 2010, although the article was two summits ago. And uh, people were looking to when their leases ended. And this one couple with 117 acres, so they started out with a $2 an acre signing bonus, so they, they cashed in on $234. They knew their lease ended in October 12, uh, 24, 2010. Three days earlier, before the lease ended, the um, gas company, Chief Oil and Gas, uh, placed their land into a unit. And they staked out an access road, and then they parked a bulldozer on one of their neighbor's properties. 31 hours before the leases ended, and then claimed to extend all 20 of the, the leases within the space of the And we know how these communities are, and we know the bulldozer operator, and he told the landowner, Chief was hot and heavy all over me to get that bulldozer up there because they need to uh, lock in some land room. So they're in court. That's how badly they try to, they need to extend their lease. Um, and as uh, Ellen explained, sometimes they'll put a half acre of 127 acre property into a drilling unit. That's been done in, in, in that and covers the entire 127 acre. So back to what's in your lease, you have to look at the first paragraph, you have to see whether or not you have an extension paragraph. We'll talk about force majeure in a minute. Delay rental is no longer used, so we don't have to talk about it. Um, and operation. So New York has a law that really needs to be rewritten uh, in terms, and this is the law that governs how one ends your lease. It's General Obligations Law 15.304 starts out sounding really good. The first paragraph says that whenever a lease expires by its own terms, so we get to that May 8, 2011, the company shall send the landowner a document that can be recorded in the county clerk and end the lease. Shall send. Not might, not should, shall. The problem is, there's no sanction or penalty when they don't, and they never do. And so then, your lease is over, it's still an encumbrance on your property, and then the second uh, paragraph of the law kicks in. So if they don't send that cancellation, then the homeowner has the option of sending a notice letter. And it has to be an absurdly detailed notice letter. In my opinion, you ought to be able to send Chesapeake, here's my lease, it expired on May 8th, send me a cancellation document. That ought to be a problem. But it isn't. And you'll see how this is not balanced when we get to the end of this section. So, and you not only have to notify Chesapeake, you have to go to the county clerk's office and find out how many other companies they have sold a portion of your lease to. Because the wording of the law is that you have to send a notice letter not only to the original company, but to all assignees, whether known or recorded. <coughs> what that means is that Chesapeake, when they sold all those leases to Stat Oil, they went to every county clerk, They filed one document with about 800 names on it in Portland County and notified the county clerk, but not the owners, that this Norwegian company had an assignment of part of their lease. But nobody that held those leases was aware of them. So you have to go to the county clerk, find an assistant that's knowledgeable and friendly enough to help you find assignments. And the way you do that is you look under the original company's name. Not your name, the original company's name. And then you have to trace each of those companies down. Because 
Well, the way I got into working on leases was we have a gas group in Cortland. It's called the Gas Drilling Awareness in Cortland County. And one of our members, uh, who used to be a uh, symphony musician until they bankrupted the symphony, and he worked to end his lease, which reminds me. He bought property with a lease. Now, if any of you have bought property with a pre-existing lease, you have to notify the company of that purchase. You should send them a copy of your deed, because that's the only way for them to know. First of all, it's required in every lease, but that's the only way for them to know that it's you that they should be communicating with, not the person that sold you the, the, the property. So Mike bought the property, he knew there was a lease on it, and then he started trying to figure out how to make it in because it, it's 10 years had ended. And it turned out that he ended up having to notify eight different companies. But we ended his lease after six months. And in the process of that, and learning what this law said, and then uh, it became very clear to us that people are not going to sort this out on their own. They made it much too confusing. And about a third of the people that come to me with leases say, well, I'll show this to my family lawyer. And he or she said, no, it's no problem. It's just a guess. Let's go ahead. Well, 99% of the lawyers in the state can't give you good, proper advice about a gas lease uh, because it's not an area that anybody practiced in five years ago. So uh, you have to go find all the assignees, and then you have to send them letters that, uh, with all this detail return receipt requested, you have to do an affidavit of service. We have forms for these notice letters, forms for the affidavit of service, excerpts from the law, and some instructions on both the FLEAST website and the GDAC website, and those are out in the lobby. And one of the things I do after evenings like this is help people get through this effort. You can't really view your lease tonight. It's very, you can't read one of those documents in two minutes with everybody milling around. But if you get me a copy of your lease through the lease that Ellen said, um, we'll work with you to figure out whether or not you can send one of these letters and then how to do it. And we've actually come up with a couple of other um, methods that have proven to be a little more effective recently. So the notice letter. You have to have the name and address of the landowners and the company, like they don't know their own name. Um, the name and address of the person writing the letter if you're not the landowner. The county, town, and state of the property. Location and general description of your property. If it's a spacing unit, the name and number. If there's a well, the name and number. The date the lease was signed and the date of termination. Much too much. So you send those off and you wait 30 days. People hold their breath for that 30 days. And in that 30 day window, now the lease is over, but this law gives the companies a new 30 day window to claim that it's not over. And if Chesapeake or Norris or whoever wants to say, no, I don't think your lease is over, all they have to do is file a two line affidavit in the county clerk. They're called Notice of Validity of Gas Lease. And basically it just says, we take the position this gas lease is still valid and it hasn't been terminated. They don't have to explain why. They don't have to give a valid reason. And once they file that, your lease is either extended or you have to try to take them to court. It's very impossible for individual homeowners to try to take one of these companies to court. So they get a 30-day window. If they file an affidavit, then it's extended. If they don't, then you can file a registered letter and the affidavit of service with the county clerk, and that, by this provisions of this law, terminates the lease. But you have to go through an awful lot to get there. But we'll help you with that uh, if, if that's the situation you're in. Again, it's, uh, every assignee must be notified. Now, some counties are online all these records. I don't know of any down here. We're very fortunate in Cortland County. We have a very uh, sympathetic county clerk and 
she has all of our land workers online. So you can sit there at home and look up whether or not the town supervisor has your gas leaks. But she does. And again, here are what we have online for you. There's GDAC, GDAC WordPress, Gas Building Awareness in Portland County, and Fleece. And uh, it's the same instructions, the same lawyer wrote them both. Uh, instructions, explanations, uh, excerpts of the law, the sample letter, sample affidavits. So, um, both Chesapeake and Norris have been making claims uh, because again, they can't afford to have these leases in, even though they have in there. If they, if they end, they lose an asset. And so they're claiming the right to extend all their leases because New York isn't giving any drilling permit. And as Ellen said, the, the legal cover that they give for that is force majeure. Most of them are force manure, but uh, and, and the idea there is that they, they claim that they weren't allowed to, to exercise their rights under the lease because the state wasn't giving them permit. Um, well, we were saying for about two years that was not a valid claim. And in November, uh, this decision came down from a federal court in Binghamton uh, where about 200 Chesapeake leaseholders challenged the force majeure claim. And the court ruled squarely in favor of the landowners and rejected Chesapeake's claim of force majeure and said it's not legal. You can't extend leases under that excuse. They're still trying. They still send out letters. If any of you have a Chesapeake letter, at least, you probably have received a, a, a registered letter from Chesapeake. Uh, they started in November and December. I've seen some as recently as April. If you have any of those letters, we really should talk, because those are so fraudulent that we now have Chesapeake under the eye of the Attorney General agreeing to end those leases if the primary term is ended. So if you've got one of those registered letters from Chesapeake afterwards, we really should talk, because that's one of the more simple uh, lease cancellations we can help with. But the court clearly said the defendants, that's the gas companies, did not contract for guaranteed production, they contracted for access. Since they drafted these leases, they were in the best position uh, to work them, and accordingly, force majeure does not extend the lease. Uh, it's based on this 1987 Court of Appeals case, that's the highest court in New York State. Uh, the problem is, companies are pretending that this didn't happen. Norse. Any of you with Norse leases have received letters within the last six months claiming force majeure extension. We have written them to try to get them to explain, well, what about the federal court decision that I just cited? And th their only response is, we think our circumstances are different. No legal uh, justification. We were talking before about what we're going to do about Norse. We will uh, develop a strategy. So, the force majeure claims are no longer uh, of any validity. And they even, Chesapeake, uh, even claim force majeure against the state of New York for the leasing that they did on state forests. There was an agreement between Chesapeake and the Attorney General last June called the Assurance of Discontinuance. Um, very bad agreement from a consumer point of view, and we're very disappointed in the Attorney General for this uh, sellout. Um, it, it was an assurance of discontinuance, it's just a fancy term for how the, the Attorney General agreed to end a investigation that they were doing of Chesapeake for fraudulent leasing firms. So last June they said, well, you, Chesapeake agreed to let 50 leases go across the state, 5-0. Then the Attorney General agreed that they had properly extended uh, 1,865 leases and for 4,365 more leases, uh, this wonderful provision, and I say that very sarcastically, 
Justin King agreed that if, if a landowner can go get a better lease, and they bring it back to us, and we don't want to match it, then they can take the better lease. Sounds good. But in reality, no company is signing leases. And certainly no company is signing better leases than they were five or so years ago. Another reason Chesapeake doesn't want to let the leases go is if they're going to release, people are now educated. They know they should get more money. They know they don't have to sign those uh, standard things with storage and uh, extensions. The lease is a contract. You can put anything in the contract you want. They may not agree to it. That's one of the problems that landowner calls. They have a 30 page lease that would be much better for landowners if they were signed. It has a lot of protection. And it has a lot of detail in it. The companies aren't signing it. Primarily because they don't want to come to New York right now and drill for methane, but also because they um, it's not to their advantage. So nobody's getting new leases, and that's the sellout of the um, Chesapeake is now using that as one of their excuses in that registered letter I talked about before to say that this agreement they signed with the Attorney General somehow gave them the right to extend every one of their leases until the end of this year, whether the primary term had ended or not. Absolutely fraudulent. There's no wording whatsoever that allows that. The Attorney General, when we can get him to talk about it, agrees that it doesn't, but won't do enough about it. So we've developed a way where uh, we compile the lease and the letter, we write a cover letter. But first we were sending them to the Attorney General, and he was sending them to Chesapeake, and Chesapeake was sending releases. Two weeks ago, the um, lawyer for Chesapeake, and we know each other, we've been on panels debating and giving uh, continuing legal education for the state of Iowa. He called me up and said, Joe, just send them to me directly and we'll get you released. So if you have one of those registered letters from Chesapeake, we can uh, take care of it. There was a scare last summer, and I think this happened down here. I know it happened up in Madison County where companies, different companies were coming around and trying to pitch mineral rights deeds to people that already had leases. And the deed signs over all of the mineral rights forever to the company, which leaves the landowner with no protection, no guarantees, and it never ends. So if somebody comes to you with those with the promise of a, a signing bonus, uh, do not do that. Then you have what's called a split estate, and you have no control over what they can do then. Counties were actually warning their citizens about these things. Um, so this is that uh, Chesapeake letter we talked about. Mortgages, there are problems with mortgages, and I just I sent three more of those Chesapeake leases off this morning. I try to catch up with this stuff on the weekend, because sometimes during the week I don't have time. But one of the leases I was going over this weekend was from a gentleman, I forget which town, and details sometimes get blurred. He was trying to refinance his house, and he had a gas. And the, the, the lawyer for the finance company said, we can't write you a mortgage until we do something about this gas list. You can either get it terminated by the company or a number of other options, none of which are, are, are easy. So you have to remember that when you go to sell or go to refinance, people look at the record, the abstract of title that's in the county clerk. And if that lease is still there, if it hasn't been canceled, it's going to cause you problems. Other problems, we've gone over briefly, compulsory integration, operation. Uh, they've, they've thrown in this new term, which uh, I think is what the paper is written on, starting in 2009, no automatic termination. It says, this lease shall be construed against termination. Uh, I don't think the court's going to think much of that, and I haven't heard it used yet, but it's an example of how the leases keep 
uh, involving to be more and more company friendly. Insurance, mortgages. So you have to be careful with your automatic extension. If you get a force majeure letter, you should act on it. If you're going to exercise your rights under 15304, you have to go for the assignment and you must act in the Now, let's well, the good news is that about a third of the leases that were signed have terminated and there are ways to go about getting cancellations or release. The bad news is that about two-thirds of them have the automatic extension. And then what do you do? Um, there really isn't much you can do until that 10 years runs out for your lease. That's why so many people are working across the state to get their towns to protect them. It's not an easy thing to do. You have to get your town board to be responsive. It takes a lot of work. We're working on one in the town of Preble. Uh, there, we think, from talking with the town board members, that we have four of the five board members on board to uh, first pass a moratorium and then study how the zoning law has to be changed and then pass a ban. The problem is we have a town lawyer that won't do what he's told and is, is, is obstructing that, but getting your town to protect you is a, is a level of work that you can get in, uh, that you can work with your neighbors in, and there are groups doing that everywhere. And sometimes it, it has to be kind of long term. You have to work to get some better people on the town board that are more responsive. That's tricky in towns because you don't have primaries, you have caucuses, but Again, there are people trying to work on educating how to do all of this. So you can get your town to protect you. And we can all write Governor Cuomo. This is his decision. And he has one rule when it comes to decisions. And that is, is this going to help me get to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue? <laughs> and he's beginning to understand. I think we really got him to begin to understand last summer. A nice welcome for him at the state fair. He never tells you, any of us, where he's going to speak. Now, he's going to have to do that next year when he's up for re-election. So we think that this uh, probably is a time when he's not going to uh, allow Franklin. But uh, we had several hundred people to welcome him to the fair and remind him of what an important issue Franklin was. Uh, and that kind of political pressure on the governor, right now, on the state senate, would protect the state water. The assembly has passed a two-year moratorium bill. Well, we all know Albany. Nothing gets done there. And right now, the, the leaders of the Senate are vowing that it'll never get out of committee. So that's the kind of political pressure that we can all think about doing, writing our senators and writing the governor, and that would help. Well, this is from last week. We were over near Watkins uh, Glen, and this is their um, bumper sticker over there. <clears throat> and so there's the contact information, and, and that's uh, what I wanted to tell you. And we'll take questions now. And we have to use a microphone. I have to take, uh, apologize. My hearing is terrible. I have the best hearing aids uh, um, So we have a mic. While they're getting the mic, I wanted to say one thing about the town ban stuff, which Joe was talking about. So I live in the town of Caroline. Uh, it's in the very southern part of Tompkins County, and there are a lot of leases there. It's uh, in part of the area where it would be uh, drilled in the southern tier. And um, a group got organized and decided that the way they wanted to approach a town ban was first to do door-to-door -door petitioning. Pretty simple, uh, would you like to see a ban or not? And I volunteered to go around my neighborhood, and I was very nervous because I knew that most of the people had leases. And I went to 25 homes, and everybody but one signed it. They understood that having a lease, in fact, was a detriment. And uh, some candidates ran for the town board on a no fracking platform, and it, they won overwhelmingly. This is not a, a radical town but 
people speak. And when surveys and polls are done, one thing is the more people know, the more they become against fracking. And the other is pretty much everywhere where polls have been done, about 60% of the people are against it. So if you're uh, concerned, you probably do want to be thinking about how to get organized in town. So do people have questions? Uh, there's a microphone coming your way. Joe, should we turn this projector off, do you think, just because it's hot? Should we turn that off? Okay. Um, okay, so if you do go through the whole process to get your lease um, terminated, um, what's a turnaround time for them to file the appropriate documents with your county clerk's office? So, as, as Joe explained, if your lease really has expired and you follow the, you go to the county clerk's office and you find out who now owns your lease, I found out mine is owned by eight individual investors as well as the gas company. Somebody told me that basically they have the equivalent of Tupperware parties out in Denver where you can buy a piece of a lease. So, I have, you have to find out who owns it and then you send this, you know, blah, blah, blah letter. And then they have 30 days, any of the assignees or the company has 30 days to send in a letter that basically says, no, I don't agree. If they don't do that, then you file that affidavit saying we didn't get anything. And then, Joe, at that point, the gas company doesn't have to do anything. Your affidavit becomes what the county clerk would then use to file a termination. Is that right? Right, you have to file copies of the letters that you sent and the affidavits of service. That's all that has to be filed. That ends your lease. Okay. Thank you. Another question? We built our house 20 years ago. A little louder. I'm sorry. We built our house about 20 years ago, and we, when they did the title search, they found gas rights on the property, so we had to have them removed. Um, you're talking about Chesapeake and Norse. We signed with XTO. Or the previous it? owner had signed with XTO. Oh. Pardon? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. So you, you bought a property 20 years ago. The title search showed that it did in fact have a gas lease. And we had it removed. And it was removed, okay. So it was no longer in the land records, exactly. okay. And then you signed a lease with XTO. XTO. Now you're talking about Chesapeake and Norse. I'm confused, I don't know. They're all different companies, and different companies operated more or less in different parts of the state, and where my town, Ansboro, was a big one. And they actually have decided they're not gonna do business in New York, and they're sort of pulling out. Joe, do you know much about XTO? She said her lease has actually been signed with XTO. Our extension was also for three years, not five. Uh, so, at this point, are you beyond the five plus three, or are you still in it? Uh, until at the end of five. July ends the fifth year. So you're going to have another three, in any case. XTO was a Texas drilling company. That's who, Chess that's who Exxon bought uh, about five years ago. They spent $41 billion to buy XTO to get back into the gas business. Ten billion of that was debt that they incurred. So that's actually Exxon that now owns your lease. If you go to the county clerk, look up XTO, you'll find a trace to Exxon. But to some extent, all of these companies operate the same. They're all desperate to cling to the leases. They can't make money drilling them now and they want to hold on to them. So uh, we use Chesapeake primarily because they're the ones really going after my neighbors up there in Cortland County. But it's certainly, we all know Exxon is no better. So that's, uh, but it is possible if, if your lease hasn't, you know, if you get to the termination date and there's no automatic extension, then you go through the same thing that we just went through up here in 15304. And we'll be here two or three years. If fracking hasn't been banned in New York, 
We'll be around to help people and every lease we can. I can't tell you how much it makes my day when I get into lease. So help me out. Okay. <laughs> okay, there's another question. Where's the mic? Here's a question up here. Hold on. Alice? Yeah. Hold on, here's the mic. Well, I was wondering, once you send the papers to Norris, what if they send you back within 30 days stating that our contract is still legal? when it's already expired last August. So the, the question is, suppose your lease really has expired, and you go through that 15304 procedure of finding out who owns your lease and sending them this paperwork or whatever, and then within the 30-day window they have, they send something back to you and the county clerk saying, we don't think it's over. Then what do you do? I'm going to turn that over to Joe. Well, that's the problem with the law, is it cuts 22 all moment. The lease is over, but you have to risk that 30-day window in order to get it cleared up. We're trying to work with people in Albany to get the law fixed. But again, we, we have a sponsor in the assembly, we can't get it out of the uh, very far in the center. So that's, there is a risk, but the risk is, so you have to wait. Do I leave that lease? on my title, and that's where it is until you do something, because the companies aren't going to do it. I had one just recently, an attorney sent a letter to the Morse, this is after the expiration, and he didn't demand the 30-day notice, but they answered him back and told him that regardless of what he thinks he's going to do, they're maintaining that uh, they are going to hold on all the pieces. Well, I've seen North send a lot of letters back. Yes, they sent letters back. Those letters aren't worth anything. Okay? They're not a legal document that goes on in the title. Now, can you put that letter into the county court? Yeah. You wouldn't want to put North's letter that claimed that, that there was valid there. But it doesn't, just sending that letter, just because North sends a letter saying your lease is still valid, doesn't do anything legal. doesn't extend the lease. Even if they file it in the county clerk, Joe? They don't file it in the county. They can't just file a letter anyway. They'd have to do, but they could, they could are, they'd have to do an affidavit or a notice of validity. But I haven't seen Norse doing that. Norse is on the books. But, but that's another reason they claim it. So yes, you have to make a decision. Do I leave it, leave my, in the county clerk, on my title? Or do I want to get the title cleared up and take that? And in terms of that risk, to some extent, you're no worse off. Meaning, if you were going to try uh, to sell your property, it's going to be a cloud on your title, unless it's released, and so you still have a problem. And if you go and say, Norse, you're over, give me a release, and they say, no, you're not, you basically are no worse off. And the reality is, if we start seeing a lot of that, I'm sure that's the kind of thing Joe and I will strategize about, which is if they're doing it based on this force majeure claim, that's a bunch of baloney. And we're gonna have to figure out how to make Joe's day by having him eat crow. I wanna ask another question um, about the compulsory integration. Now, if, if you're in the part that not least, can they, take your gas and everything without telling you, or do they have to tell you? So in terms of the compulsory integration part of this, if you are part of a spacing unit and the DEC decides to give a permit, they must give you, I think it's 30 days notice about compulsory integration. So you have a little time. And as I say, you can't question whether DEC should give the permit or not. It's already, that's already done. What you can do is uh, tell the DEC how you want to participate in that. They have to pay you the same amount as they pay the person who is leased. So, uh, hold on, I'll answer and then Joe will answer. In a lease, you can negotiate what the royalty rate is. 
Most of us were stupid and signed for 12.5%, which is the lowest possible. And that's what you'd get in compulsory integration if you didn't elect to be a part owner and all that, which most people wouldn't. And the person who had a lease, if they were really smart, can negotiate 20% royalties. They do that in Texas. I don't know that in New York most people probably didn't. Um, there's one coalition lease that was signed um, by uh, Dewey Decker was the sort of chief honcho in that group and the, what was it, Friendsville lease and it was signed a bunch of years ago. And those guys actually got themselves quite a lot of money and I think they may have negotiated a higher royalty rate. So there's nothing by law except a minimum and that's the 12 and a half and that's what you'd get with compulsory integration unless you elected a different way to participate in it. And the lessors, the people who leased, could have negotiated more. That's it. Okay. Any more questions? There's one right there. Hold on. It's a standard procedure that um, the royalties are not paid for one year after the first gas is produced. The gas is productive on day one. You wait a whole year before you get a royalty. I don't know. Did you hear it? Um, the question is, does the gas company, or are you asserting that it does, in fact? Yes. Okay. This gentleman believes that gas companies wait a year, they produce for a year, before they calculate and give you royalties. I don't know. Uh, you know, I've heard something very much like that, that they delay. Yeah. Uh, but since they're not drilling in New York, we don't know that. But I've certainly heard of that problem before, that, that they delay. And the other thing that we've seen is that they're not paying at all. Um, well, they're and paying. We have a friend in West Virginia. He's Can you farmer. talk into the microphone? His royalty is $28 a month. Woohoo! <laughs> well, okay. first of all, there's proof that these companies have routinely defrauded the federal government on the amount of gas they've taken out of federal leases. So, let's assume that they get a, a, a well on your property or in your space. How do you know how much gas is coming out of it? But she doesn't know. All of this you have to trust the company, and there's almost no oversight. The DEC has 17 people to monitor all of these wells that they want to drill in New York. 30, 40, sometimes you hear the figure, 70,000 wells. How does anybody, so you have to trust these companies that they're going to do a proper recording. There's no inspector there. So all of this is, is subject to the companies cutting every corner they can, particularly when they're in such bad financial shape. And I think one of the things that uh, surprised me is, you know, you, when you go to pump gas into your car, there's a thing about how the weights and measures guys have been there to be sure that the pumps are doing what they're supposed to do. As Joe was alluding to, there's no such oversight of the gas drilling and what's pumping. The gas company says, this is how much gas was produced, and nobody is monitoring that. One other aside I wanted to mention is, um, I'm from a county that's been very concerned about what kind of costs there are going to be to municipal government. And even if municipal government gets some property tax revenues from gas, that doesn't come until long after many of the costs have been borne by the government. Whether it's planning costs or dealing with roads, dealing with emergency services, dealing with um, police issues. So. Uh, it, the financial thing is not just for the people who have leases, it's also for municipal government. Is there another question? Gentlemen, back. Where's the mic? I understand that... Give him the mic. The Make him use it. I understand that the, a town okay, that gets money back from the oil company, the gas company, that it will help the school taxes, but you get less state aid from the state. I must confess, I am not an expert in that issue. I do believe that actually municipal governments 
you know, we went to talk to people in Bradford, Pennsylvania, municipal governments actually suffer financially fairly significantly from the gas development. I don't know about the school tax. And basically what I was told, again, by some of the Pennsylvania people is that the gas companies come in and try to sweeten the pot. You know, we'll build you a new ball field and we'll do this and we'll do that. But in the long run, uh, the economics are pretty hard on municipalities. There was a guy back there with a question. Can you bring him the mic, Barbara? Um, I have a question if, if you have not leased in preparation or in, 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 in anticipation of um, fracking being passed in the state, uh, is there anything that one can do to prepare for um, preventing themselves from being subject to compulsory integration or stopping compulsory integration? Just something that you can do yourself. Is there anything at all or any advice that you have? It's, it's a good question. And one of the things that I find quite amazing is that compulsory integration, uh, when it goes forward, goes forward without people being able to sort of make choices. And one of the reasons that various of us signed is the landman, when he came to the door, said, your neighbors have all signed. You might as well sign, because otherwise you're not going to get any upfront payment. You know, he was speaking about compulsory integration. He also, the, the handbook that Joe mentioned said, tell them their neighbors have signed whether they have or they haven't. So that could be another line. I'm thinking that compulsory integration is something that seems to me really un-American and that it should unite very conservative Tea Party type people with anti-fracking people. Because if you believe in property rights, I think that compulsory integration is a real violation. I have not yet heard about a big groundswell about that. Um, I think it's the compulsory integration law is a state law and it was passed I think in 2005. As Joe was alluding to right now, the assembly is likely to pass a bill that would change it, but the Senate is not. So I think we need people to begin to get angry and let their legislators know that this is not okay. And I have yet to see a real groundswell and movement, and I hope we do. My friend Tom List, the lawyer for Chesapeake, brags about writing the compulsory integration statute. So that tells you how bad it is. It's written by the gas companies. It passed around midnight the last day of the legislative session when we know so much sneaks through. It needs to be changed. There's no, it has no scientific validity um, for shale gas. The idea is that if you are drilling for conventional gas in a pocket, and you drill on my property, and a third of the pocket is on um, Ellen's property, by drilling here, I'm going to take that third from Ellen. She should get compensated. That's what the compulsory integration should be protected. For shale gas, they can turn these drill bits on a dime, and they can drill around property. And they're not when they frack my property. It only goes out a few hundred feet. It doesn't take all of the gas in that pocket. So it, it's it's not even scientifically justified. And the best protection is to organize your neighbors about drilling. Because I, I think when most people understand what people in Pennsylvania are going through and the risk inherent in a standard lease, they're not going to want to sign. And so that's another reason that I like to bust leases. I'm sitting in a county where there are plenty of places they can find 60% of the land. If I can take out 10% of those leases, that'll help protect all. Can I just ask, um, do you expect people to do you expect the people to challenge it? I mean, are people going to in challenge terms it? of the compulsory integration? I was mentioning that in three counties around here, that information is being gathered about 
spacing units that have been proposed and identifying properties within that that would be subject to compulsory integration because they're in a, spacing, a proposed spacing unit but they don't have a lease. And I am hopeful that by um, letting these people know that they're potentially going to be subject to compulsory integration, I'm hopeful that some of those people will get agitated and will start to take action. And then if maybe you're one of them, that would be great. Another question over here, Mark, can you? Yeah, the time is getting late, and if people need to leave, they should. And I think Joe and I are willing to stay and answer a few more questions to the group. Hi, I'm going to make this quick. Given there are obviously conf conflicting views in Albany, as you've already mentioned, the two houses and so forth, are there particular elements in the, the regulations that have been getting chewed over by DEC that would help to undo or essentially zip out some of the most undesirable portions of these contracts? So the question was basically in terms of the action that DEC might take in terms of granting permits or the Something state sort of environmental of impact story. statement, what, whether it be helpful to most of these things. And the answer is the only thing I am aware of that was in the draft regulations and could be in the S guys had to do with setback distances. So that business about mortgages and you know the 200 foot setback. That is something that the draft regulations began to address, uh, didn't solve. Uh, the regulations are not going forward at this time. So the answer is, all the rest of these issues, no. No, it doesn't address it. Um, where's the mic? This gentleman had a question, Barb, should we allow him? Um, this is directed to both of you. Um, I was out in western Pennsylvania and Ohio in that area, and uh, there was a, I didn't see one anti-frac sign, or I didn't see one for it, you know, and there was drilling going on and pumping stations and a lot of activity. But my question is, what if I go home tonight, turn my thermostat up, and there's no gas there? A very fair question. The question, I think, is... One, one other thing I want to add to that. In, you know, I like my gas stove. There's no odor, or odor from it. There's, you know, there's no uh, emission from it that's going to harm me that I know of. Maybe somebody will find something. But, you know, our energy production is directly tied or cheap energy, I should say, to our gross national product. It's in the So the question basically is, uh, what about the fact that we use gas and that it's relatively cheap, which has benefits in terms of uh, the economy in certain ways? So obviously, I mean, that's also one of the reasons I signed. I didn't want to be NIMBY. I use energy. So I shouldn't say, just do it over there, not where I live. A couple things have, have brought me around. One is that I've become a believer that we need to have renewable energy and that it's feasible. There was a paper that came out fairly recently that said New York could be totally on renewables, and it wasn't by a bunch of radical dudes. It was by a professor at Stanford and some professors at Cornell. And I think it was by 2030, we could be completely off fossil fuels in New York. So that's one thing. I know there's a movement in my county, and then it's Madison County, and I think Cortland County, to call, it's called Solarize Tompkins, that's my county. And the concept there is a lot of people would be interested in doing solar. Yes, it's cloudy here. Germany is way cloudier, and I think it's something like half of their energy is now produced by solar. So it's a feasible thing. And what there is, is there's kind of an inertia barrier. It's like, I don't know. I don't know enough about it, and I don't know who does it well. The Solarize movement is basically, um, in this case, a citizens group that organized, and they have together looked at contractors, selected a contractor who's giving a really good price, 
because economy of scale, if they can come in. And so we're going to end up putting solar on our house. There's pretty good payback from uh, the State Energy Research and Development Authority. The payback period is not that long. We also put geothermal in at our house. Sounds weird, but we have pipes that run in our pond. And because of the way this system works, even when the pond is 34 degrees in the winter, it is supplying heat to some coils that are gas, compressed gas. And so my hope is, personally, that I'm not going to be using fossil fuels. No, because anywhere you use and get fossil fuels, it's painful for the environment and contributes to global climate change, which I'm frankly thinking is a pretty scary thing. So what I've also found in my life, I'm old enough to have been through um, the oil gouging, the oil shortage in the 70s, etc. Basically, we never get serious about renewables because we make other things cheap. And we do that because we subsidize the heck out of it. So I am not swayed by your arguments. I don't think they hold up. I think we have alternatives. Joe, you wanted to add something. I, uh, when I built my house, I looked at the solar, but the price was prohibitive. Come down. Come down a lot. Yeah, but in my income, the price is still from. In my area, you can lease it, so you pay nothing. Hmm? You can we, lease we have, it. We're going to have to answer to our children and our grandchildren what we're doing right now. We have climate change to the extent that if we don't do something in 20 years, there won't be a civilization here as we know it. You will not be able to live in New York and grow the kinds of food and everything else that we have. We cannot keep burning fossil fuels. Cannot keep burning fossil fuels, and what this this resource is being built as a bridge to a clean future. It's not doing that. It's in fact because they've driven the price so low, they've kept people from renewables. We give massive over ten billion dollars a year to the five biggest oil companies in subsidies. It should be affordable on your house by subsidies. There are places in. California and Arizona and Florida that have mortgages so that people can put solar panels on their house. We have to find a way to find renewable energy. It's there. It's coming down. The more people that do it, the better. We have to do this. We have. To, we can't let Exxon and Chesapeake set our energy policy, and that's what we're doing. I think actually, if there if there's a question that's specific to the kind of things we've addressed, happy to do it. We're also now about 10 minutes beyond, so a last question. A last you question. talk renewable energy, okay, and, and costs going down and everything. And also, you know, problems with the gas companies and also with the government. I'm hearing more problems with the government than I'm hearing with gas companies, number one. Number two is we just invested all kinds of money, okay, renewable energy, all right? And all the companies have gone bankrupt and we lost all that money. I think these guys have a different agenda, and I really don't think at this point Joe and I have a point of view and feel very strongly that uh, the leasing and fracking of New York is going to be a big detriment to all of us here. And I don't think we need to get into a debate about renewables, because frankly that's not what we were presenting on. So.